Huh? Can I? Okay, awesome. Cool. Um, no? Mouse? 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 I hope it... Uh, it's right in the center of Hamburg, actually. Um, super nice offices with other startups as well. Um, in Africa House with two big elephants and lots of tourists coming in all the time. Yeah. <laughs> Not into the offices, just in the yard. Cool. Um, let's get started. I already talked a bit about what's on here. Um, basically, what I want to reiterate right now for the talk is we have a lot of things flowing through the system. We're currently importing 80 million products from different um, online shops for fashion into our system. And we have to do some magic and show them to the users. So basically, it's um, all about scalability and therefore um, maintainability of that scaling system. And it's highly dynamic because, of course, lots of data are flowing through. So let's start with the actual thing. Um, I will talk a bit about patterns for reactive Node.js microservices. Um, and of course, I'll start with a short vote. Um, who of you is currently working or has been working in production on microservices? Hands up. Oh, okay, it's almost like 50%. Um, who um, is, has or is working with reactive microservices in production? Okay, that's Vitaly, my beloved colleague. That's awesome. Um, so I kind of anticipated that situation, which is um, why the patterns, most of, or all of them, will also be applicable in non-reactive contexts. Because um, I think this is a nice showcase to go into reactivity, but in the end, you want to take something home to use. Um, I won't talk about why microservices make sense. I won't talk about how they work. And I won't talk about why if multiple systems access one database, there are no microservices. So for the basics, there's the internet. Um, I hope this is not entirely Googleable. Um, so let's start. We have um, since, I think today you can say decades, um, a thing called service-oriented architectures, which the ba where the basic underlying idea is decoupling things. And out of that, microservices developed, some argue, um, some I would agree with, actually, that if you do SOAs right, you automatically end up at something like microservices and not at the enterprise service bus that some may know. Um, the same actually holds for reactive microservices, um, in a way. Some argue that if you really want to truly decouple the systems, you have to go message-driven, you have to go reactive. Um, some disagree with that. That's an open and interesting discussion, actually. Um, I will focus on the red bubble here. Let's get started to take a look at what it actually is. Um, reactive is just another term. Um, probably all of us know it from, like, ah, sorry, microphone. Um, probably all of us know it from um, React JS, of course, from reactive programming in general. Um, meaning, in an oversimplified way, reacting to events and having a more declarative, more almost functional, sometimes truly functional style of programming, style of connecting things. Um, there's a thing called Reactive Manifesto, accessible at reactivemanifesto.org, um, which postulates four properties of reactive systems. The first is that reactive systems, or a system can call itself reactive if it is always responsive. Um, that means if you, if you if, as a user, be it a machine or a human, um, you always get a response no matter what. That also has to hold if errors happen. So it has to be resilient in that it is responsive even if errors happen. Same holds for um, load. So elasticity is a very important property. If load increases, the system has to stay responsive. Of course, in practice, nobody would start a startup and then create something that would scale within an hour to hundreds of millions of requests. But building things scalable by design actually is pretty important. The only property um, or the only thing that the reactive manifesto says about the internal workings is that, they, that a reactive system has to be message driven. Um, that is a point that they make um, with rather short um, reasons. Um, I would totally agree, but discussing why doing um, message-driven helps doing things responsive is a whole different talk and a whole different discussion. So we'll just stick to that. And by the way, as I forgot to like 
give a short overview of what I will be talking about today. I will start with um, defining reactive microservices and afterwards I will go to through a long list of my favorite patterns. Yeah, those two things basically. Um, so let's start and take, or let's continue and take a look at what message and event driven are. I don't differentiate between them for this talk because it's irrelevant for this talk. Um, there's three ways of communicating asynchronously. One is you could like use notifications. You could send a notifi notification like something happened and then the receiver has to fetch data or do something on their own to work with that data. Then there's um, what Fowler calls event carried state transfer. And the idea of that is that you put all the data inside the event and if a receiver gets that event, the receiver can do anything with that that they like. So no additional fetching required. And then being a subset of that is event sourcing, um, which I don't have the time today to really dive into it. Um, so um, event sourcing is basically a way of interacting between services and a way of storing historized data in a so-called event log and much more. It's awesome. Google it. Um, the first one is not really reactive because the receiving side still has to fetch data from somewhere to action an event. And fetching data from somewhere, by definition, cannot really happen message driven. It's a request, it's a synchronous operation, so it's not reactive. The other two actually are. So let's take a uh, look at a thing called a data flow chart. What we see here is four services, A to Z, um, talking to each other, um, transferring some kind of payload from one to the other. Um, the color indicates which service is responsible. I made that up. In the actual data flow diagram, there's no colors. Um, and the arrow indicates in which direction the actual payload flows. That means it's not about who initiates the uh, communication, it's only about how the actual payload flows. So here, for example, we have the situation that A executes a query on the database, therefore the actual like select or something, the actual payload makes its way from the database to service A. Then we have a situation where service B pulls service A for changes, therefore it is responsible for that, but the actual payload, when something happens, moves from A to B. So we can't tell from the data flow chart um, what kind of interaction it is. The data flow chart doesn't care about that. Um, here, for example, we have a push notification. So as soon as B gets data from the polling, it push notifies, it push notifies C so that C is aware of what actually happened. And then we have the situation that D is simply subscribing to C. So it's continuously, it's like talking through message broker or any other means to get events from service C. So those are different ways of interacting between services. And it turns out that this, of course, is not reactive because it's a synchronous operation to tell a database, I want A, B, and Z, and then get it. Even if you use messages for that, it doesn't really make it, it doesn't make it reactive. Polling, oh, we can argue about that. I would say it's a synchronous way of emulating asynchronicity, but whatever, not important for today. These two are truly asynchronous or truly reactive. So now we know what a data flow chart looks like. Let's take a look at the A simplified chart of services um, at StyleLounge. Um, you can replace StyleLounge with any other company. It's not really about StyleLounge. It's about how they interact. And here again, the colors indicate um, the colors indicate who is responsible for what. And in this case, it's subscriptions. So the mailing subscribes to these three services. And what happens here? Um, the product catalog gets data from the feeds that we import from the web shops. There's like millions of products in there and the product catalog fetches them. And then what the product catalog does is it publishes events um, that we call lifecycle events. It's product created, product updated, product deleted. So every time something about the state, about the internal state of the product catalog changes, it publishes an event for the others to subscribe to that. So every time something happens outside our company, um, this thing will publish an event. That's the sole responsibility of this. The scoring then subscribes to these changes and every time something changes, 
it maintains its local state, it, update, update, it updates its local state, and calculates scores. We use scores um, to know in which order to show products to the users. Um, we have some pretty sophisticated scores because that's basically the core of our business. So let's take a look at these two. The web app subscribes to these lifecycle events and to the events of the scoring. So every time the scoring calculated a new score, it publishes an event for others to subscribe, in this case, the web app. The web app maintains its own state, in our case, in Elasticsearch, containing products with scores. So the web app is the only component in this picture right now, because we're only looking at these three, um, that is aware of products with scores. The product catalog has no idea about that. Um, meaning in reactive microservices, it's most of the times really, really easy to, to cut services, to find out how, what exactly is a service, because managing data responsibility is much easier. Um, so the web app now has up-to-date products, and of course, users browse the web app and they do things. So they, for example, um, yeah, click products, go to categories, use filters, and then they create tracking data. The web app push notifies the tracking of these tracking data, and the tracking pushes that in a huge database, currently like, like huge, but for us it's huge, it's two terabytes right now, um, and it aggregates them. So every few minutes it um, publishes aggregated product, or publishes aggregated tracking events for products, like product A has been um, in the viewport 500 times and it has been clicked like five times. And from that, we can calculate how relevant it is to the user. And this happens in the scoring. Um, and the mailing is just another service that is subscribing. The interesting part is what happens if things go wrong? <laughs> Let's assume the product catalog crashes. Usually, I mean, these things are components, so they tend to consist of other microservices that in turn, again, are reactive. But let's keep to the simplified picture and let's assume like this entire thing crashes. What happens is the user doesn't notice, the user doesn't care, is unaware of, the web app is unaware of it, because the only thing that happens is no new events come in. So the web app has its own state. It never fetches data from any other service. It maintains its own state. Users, users can browse it and they're happy. It's related to caching, but of course it's different because it's event driven. Um, so this works. Users are on the website, they create tracking data. It flows through here, it flows through here, it flows through here. So the scoring right now is still able to recalculate scores for all products that it's currently aware of. Um, of course, no new updates come in, but as soon as they come in again, they will automatically be scored and will automatically make it to the web app. So if I wanted to um, talk to my granny about resilient microservice architectures, this is probably what we could, what we would come up with if, I don't know, if he was infected by an alien brain virus or something, but basically it's like the best thing you can do. There's like, if this is broken, um, everything else is still working, it's just no updates coming in. If this breaks as well, of course it gets more serious, but if one of the developers has the idea, well, let's not fix it, nobody needs products, I would rather deploy my new scoring strategy. Then that developer can, of course, deploy that scoring strategy to production, and the scoring service will automatically rescore all products that it is aware of using the tracking data that it is aware of. So again, it's working as good as it can without any boilerplate, without any additional caching around HTTP requests or whatever and the web app would still receive the up-to-date scores. So in a distributed system, that way, the, if these were teams, which they are not, they wouldn't even have to talk with each other. Okay, um, one can hear that I really like that. Um, so if the scoring dies, of course, things get more difficult. Um, the web app is basically static, um, but it's still working. So there's, again, never a data fetch request. There's no HTTP in the back end, and the web app can still work. So, yeah, this is reactive microservices in a nutshell. Um, the basic idea is to do heavy data duplication and have bounded contexts from DDD for each individual service. So you subscribe to what you need, you maintain your own state, you have your own view on the world in your service, and then whenever an event comes in, you can fully action that, publish something, and others can subscribe to that. Um, going this way, um, we ended up at currently 77 
different, meaning different code microservices that are running in six countries right now. And yeah, it's basically working. I mean, the challenges are different, but actually they're more fun. And let's continue. Yeah, actually, that was the slide that I was currently talking about. Um, so it's got pretty big. We have 22 instances of individual databases per country because databases are super cheap. We're never discussing domain models. We're never, um, we, we uninstalled Visual Paradigm after some time, which was a very good feeling. Um, and it's basically just about those small interconnectivity points where you publish something and then others can subscribe to that. It's like if you're, if you're designing a front end in React, you would never create an entire data model about what every, how everything looks like and how it's related in a entity relationship diagram. Nobody does that and nobody needs it. And the same holds if you go reactive in the back end. It's just about events. And if you don't like an event, you crash and then somebody fixes it and a minute later or an hour later it works again. Okay, patterns. Um, questions about reactive, about like the basic understanding of reactive microservices because everything else I'd like to do afterwards, but it would be horrible if like five people have no idea what I'm talking about and now I start with patterns. Cool, everybody's too shy, awesome. Um, so, yes. This one? Per country, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, many of them are stateless. So there's actually cases where we um, violate the microservice paradigm because there's reasons. Um, but in this case, most of them are basically stateless. So if you score, for example, there could be another thing that has its own database publishing something and then you have a stateless thing because that scales much better. I mean, the, the, the underlying idea is not having fun with events, it's scalability and maintainability. Okay, um, first pattern. Um, no, first, what are patterns or what, are, what am I talking about today when I'm talking about patterns? Um, it's not design patterns from the Gang, gang of Four, it's like a mixture of best practice and we found out it works that way, so let's give it give a name to it, or at least let's put it somewhere into what would we like to do. Um, by the way, it's getting hot in here. Um, is that me moving too much? I don't know. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, it doesn't have the guys in the back, but <laughs> okay, whatever. Um, so let's start with some patterns. Um, let's start with the basics that I won't be talking about today. Um, so um, if one doesn't know one of them, just Google it. And yeah, they're awesome. There's no way of not doing it. And especially for testing, I just love testing. That's why I want to make that additional case. It's awesome. Most failures come from not testing. And it costs so much more time to not test. End of I love testing patterns. There are some patterns that are important during the design phase. And I would like to start with the walking skeleton because um, that is a pattern, um, basically us having to pay 2000 or offering 2000 euros for new developers comes from us not having done the walking skeleton because right now I'm coding way too much to do proper HR um, because we integrated very late and that hurt a lot. And now we're wiser, but it took us some time. So the basic idea is um, to not start with a feature, but start with the integration, to deploy everything into production without any business logic. In reactive microservices, that would mean having a new microservice worker that is just subscribing to things and publishing fake, fake data, and that can be hard-coded. And bringing that into production and then connecting things with, you, with each other and having fake data in some weird databases um, gives, reduces integration pain significantly. So that would have saved us weeks, if not, yeah, probably more like months, to be honest. Um, so that's something um, we never regretted going more towards the walking skeleton. The more we did it, the better. We didn't come even close to the point where we're like, okay, we overdid it. So at least today, I would say um, it's hard to overdo it. And it's awesome. Um, 
The next one, canonical naming in a microservice architecture, especially if some of the microservices are only like 200 lines of code. It's really, really important to know um, to, how to address things, to know what you're talking about. Um, here's a small example. We have a component called product catalog, and we have a component called tracking, component called scoring, and a component called mailing. This, again, is a data flow chart that I colored. Uh, I like coloring things. And if we look at the actual names, it gets more complicated. Um, but we can see patterns here. We, for example, have the mailing product persister, which is what we call a subservice of the mailing component that is subscribing to product events and persisting them. We have a scoring product persister, which basically does the same thing for the scoring, just with a different domain and different database, whatever, but the same thing. Then we have the scoring tracking persister, the mailing tracking persister, the tracking persister that just persists events that come from the tracking pixel. And most of our currently 77 microservices, I think on the homepage it's still 65 because it's two months ago, um, most of them have names like that. They, they tend to get pretty long at some point, but you always know what you're talking about. You always know what you're looking for. We never give names like Jimmy to a microservice. You can do it, but it's fun, but it doesn't work. Nobody has any idea what they're talking about. Um, and the same, of course, for database. Um, it's important to have consistency, like what is a database, what is a cache. In the end, it doesn't matter too much, but knowing it makes it really, really easy. And what's inside that database, like the scoring product DB, for example. Of course, in practice, they're much longer. Um, so we have a staging environment. We pre pre prefix things with staging. We have sites, um, like DE or US, and we have instances if we cluster services. So in practice, of course, we will have things like the S scoring persister DE1, which the S scoring calculator DE1 subscribes to among all the other four or however many those are. And where it gets even better is that you can give domain names to those things. So each of our services, this is fake, so don't even try it. Um, but actually it's the same domain, but whatever. Um, try to find it out. Um, what we do is we take this canonical name, as we coined it, um, or as probably one would coin it, um, and then put SLI for Stylaunch Infrastructure Ninja. We bought that domain. Those domain names are maintained automatically. And therefore, if you want to look what's happening on a broker or what Prometheus metrics does a service have, you know how to address it. You have to know the port, which usually you do if you know what kind of application is running, and that's it and the name, and like the production site, stuff like that, that comes natural. Canonical names. Um, and as like to add to that, um, I think it's really important to make subtle differences um, visible. And yeah, make them visible two times, why not? Um, so for example, country versus site versus top level domain. Um, we at some point started with um, DE, CH, NL, FR as top level domains. And then we use the same thing to identify different sites. Of course, at some point, um, the US came along and we had a site called, dot, dot, called com. The problem with that is if people start relying on that, you run into serious problems. Like for example, um, what do you do if you address the Hispanic community and you want a separate site in the US? It's really, really hard to do that. Um, so what do you do? You come up with another thing, but people already relied on the first thing having separate, separate meanings. So um, I think it's important to really find, fight hard to get super precise wordings for things and spend time on renaming. Um, sometimes I'm being a bit loathed for renaming things all the time, but on the other hand, it gives you so much orientation when you join the company or when you drank too much on the previous night, it just helps a lot. Um, and of course, don't couple contexts. This is me not understanding that Google Slides doesn't know emoji, but um, when, for example, when you work with Kubernetes and you have containers and pods and stuff like that, then um, it's easy to say like, okay, what's a microservice for us should always be a pod. A pod should be a microservice. That's super easy to do. Um, the problem is it will always hurt in the long term if you, if you couple contexts like, for example, what do we think is an application and what does Google think is an application or a pod or whatever. So keeping that separate 
helps a lot. And that is this slide. <laughs> um, data structures. And by the way, my goal is kind of to do some kind of knowledge dump. So if I'm speaking too fast, raise a hand. Um, data structures. And I would first, uh, I'm a huge fan of Rich Hickey, and therefore I would like to start with values over objects. Um, what we see here is two ways of representing the same underlying real world thing. Um, we have a user class, a pet unicorn class, and what we're creating here is a user A with a pet unicorn called Evin. Um, and what we have here is basically the same thing, um, not using classes. And I'm really happy to, 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 to um, not only work in a um, pure JavaScript company, but also to be talking at a pure JavaScript meetup, because having this discussion with Java people it just doesn't work. doesn't make sense. Um, just don't do it. Um, so there's some advantages to values. I call this a value and this an object. Actually, of course, both are objects. It's just lack of me knowing a better name. If somebody knows one, tell me. These are super easy to fabricate. They're completely language agnostic, super easy to put into a wire format. Every language has JSON encode, JSON decode. Um, they are immutable, which is awesome. Um, try to create classes that are, and by the way, sorry, who works, who knows what immutability is? Cool, awesome, awesome. Um, so this thing is really easy to make immutable, and this thing is really hard to make immutable. You need shitloads of getters and setters, and they're, it's just boilerplate with errors. And doing this immutable also allows you to go with pure function, to go with proper state management, with all those things that come with it. And, of course, it's super easy to aggregate. If I need a Meister Ada that has five pet unicorns, I just create one. I just turn this into an... Um, I just turn this into an array. If you have that with classes, you have all kinds of coupling problems. Of course, sometimes you want to protect against having one Meister Ada with multiple pet unicorns. And with this, much more stuff can go wrong, which is why we need to protect against that. And that is, ignore the four, um, <laughs> and that is um, pretty easily done by validation. There's um, some different ways of validating. This is actually validating um, even the type. This is not doing that because um, it's TypeScript. And this is validating using a schema validator. In our case, it's also rejecting the message um, if it is not valid, which is an OK behavior in a message-driven system. It's like a, I don't know, 4 or something error in HTTP world. Um, so with this, you can validate against a lot of problems, like having too many pet unicorns, pretty easily in a declarative way. And to, yeah, during runtime, of course. And let's continue here. That's more interesting, actually. Um, the cool thing about classes is that they, pr they provide some kind of structural integrity. So um, if you deserialize and serialize um, objects from the wire into classes and back to the wire, then basically you're kind of safe that things are okay, and that's a huge argument for classes. Actually, um, in my opinion, schema validation is much more powerful for that because the job of schema validation is to validate data. The job of classes is not to validate data, and of course, um, one can have inheritance, but yeah, different discussion. In my opinion, inheritance sucks for objects, but um, different discussion. So what you can do is you have an interface called iUser that tells developers, everybody alike, during development time, what the object should look like. And um, I'm a huge fan of TypeScript or Flow. doesn't really matter. Um, and the thing is, if you use this, during development time, you're pretty safe against um, the, a, the class of error that comes with not having static typing. If you have schema validation at the same, same time, you're basically like super safe um, because you know that things are safe during runtime in a much more powerful way than just using hydration and dehydration with some weird if conditionals. And you're safe during development time against the common errors that happen if you don't have typings. And this is super cheap. You don't need any serialization, deserialization. Um, you're just talking, defining what it actually looks like and protect that with the, with the schema. So, awesome. 
and errors. Lots of code, it's not that much actually. We have this thing here. So we want a fetch method that doesn't crash our application because we have a very costly application that we don't want to crash or because somebody told us crashing is bad. Inside this um, function, what we actually want to do is we want to select the red gummy beers and be gone. That's it. Um, if we now actually want to protect against crashing, what we could do, for example, is we could have retries, we could check the error message. If there's an error of one of those errors, we could disconnect and try the same thing again with less retries and so on and so on. I'm pretty sure everybody saw this kind of code in production. Um, there's multiple problems with this. A, the ratio of business logic to boilerplate bullshit is like 5%, in practice probably 1%, because this is like to put it on one slide. In reality, it's like pages of things that could happen. And also what comes with it, it's pages of things that can go wrong. Like this is really, really dangerous. And what happens to other parts of the system if we're in a concurrent, I mean, we're doing JavaScript. So what happens here if, if we're back on the event loop? So dangerous, what could happen if crashing were okay, we could write it like this. And that's basically it. Um, the cool thing about reactive microservices, and I think about other systems as well, but it's a bit harder, is that you can super easy, easily crash. If you crash, basically the service restarts, be it via upstart or initd or Kubernetes, it really doesn't matter. It just restarts, it gets the same message again, and it tries to action it. And if it doesn't work, it crashes again, and then you have a restart loop, which can happen, but is fixable. The cool thing is this one. It doesn't hurt the user because it's just another message on some queue somewhere back hidden in the system. And if the corresponding worker just crashes and crashes and crashes, updates don't make it through. But usually not having an up-to-date website is okay. Even if you work with transactions or buying things, losing a few seconds and having an optimistic UI or even minutes is usually okay. I mean, it depends, like if you're doing cars, then it's different, like if you're on the street, but even there a few seconds. Um, so usually people are happy to accept a few seconds if the UI is optimistic. More importantly, errors are not hidden because you have that in your log. You're not like catching and then logging and then you have to scroll through logs, stuff like that. And of course, for developers, there's no boilerplate. So to add to that, what's also really dangerous about um, typical error handling is um, warning or logging in general and then returning defaults if something breaks. This could work if this is some, some, some stateless um, remote system, like talking to BigQuery, for example, via Google Cloud or whatever. The problem is if the query function now changes because somebody adds a cache, which is awesome, cool move, why not? Um, and it first tries to hit the cache and then it does the actual request. Um, and yeah, I'm lacking the await and the return. Let's, no, actually I'm not. Cool, I'm la just lacking the await. Whatever. Um, what happens here is while we're writing this, this is okay. If somebody changes the method that we, or a function that we call at a later point in time, we can get to the point that catching a generic error leaves us in a zombie state. So if this fails and the cache is not usable afterwards, this method will return, but we will have an unusable cache. And then sometimes later, the entire application will crash or start behaving non-deterministic, super weird. And we have to scroll through lots of logs to find out what actually went wrong looking for this thing. And the problem with that is that execution paths and try blocks tend to change over time. We're, happening, we're uh, catching errors that we didn't anticipate while we wrote the code. And yeah, that's bad because the app is a zombie. Again, what's helping against this? We don't have to go reactive. We just have to be super strict about what we catch. And if it's not exactly what we're exact expecting, we have to throw through to make the entire application crash. This is, of course, dangerous, but if we're careful here, it works. Next, more patterns. Reuse. Uh, what we also encountered is that um, we totally underestimate um, how dangerous reuse of code is. 
If you extract codes, uh, code from two different apps, for example, or two different parts of a system, you couple them together pretty tightly. And we, I, in my entire history, and maybe some of you too, overestimate the immediate time savings of extracting code and totally underestimate um, the maintainability issues that come with it. So um, DRY is awesome. It's, I mean, it's basically what the build is, world is built from. It's NPM is nothing but DRY, but it's really important to understand what downsides it can have. Um, so copy pasting, of course, is dangerous, but basically copying and adapting is what's, what, what learning basically defines. So if you, if, you, if you do something here, and then the next time you have the problem, you copy the code and take your time to adopt, adapt it, then over time, that code, the probability that you will either reuse it and be happy with it or decide against reusing it will, de will increase significantly. So for me personally, yeah, another sentence. Um, coding is about learning and not about the code that you're writing. Um, what worked for me personally is this five times rule. It really depends and that's something every, everybody has to find out. Not only having repeated something five times before reusing, but also not having had to change it because that's basically what usually happens. You write something, then you have the same glasses on for a few weeks, and then afterwards doesn't really work, and then creating special conditions inside, inside externalized code, and yeah, things get nasty. So, and my f yeah, I think, yeah, okay, they're all my favorite ones, but I really like that one, because I, I did it for years and years and years, and I think everybody does it. Um, frameworks suck, never ever should anybody create frameworks except for framework people. Um, it's super easy to imagine like, okay, today we're here and then maybe this component is added and that component is added, names might change, relations might change. That's super easy. Uh, that's isomorphic plus X, like, like you have the same shape kind of. It's almost impossible if you, if you design a system and think about how should it work together to think how it could not work in the future. That's just something brains don't do. I have no idea why. Probably it helped us survive in the past. I don't know. So don't even try. Um, the problem with frameworks is they lock in the current state. That's why there's new frameworks over time. And um, what people do is like, yeah, let's reduce that. No boilerplate. Woohoo. But in the end, boilerplate doesn't hurt if it's maintainable, if it's understandable. What really hurts is the lack of maintainability. And of course, Brevity, brevity, brevity um, can lead to maintainability, but it doesn't necessarily do. So, oh, frameworks. Um, I did that for years. And yeah, who would use a framework that nobody else uses from off the internet? Nobody does that. Nonetheless, we tend to write them. Probably many people know that situation coming into a company and first learning about that company's frameworks that everybody's super proud of and it makes so much sense for the domain and now you have to deal with it. Um, and everybody, yeah, I'm repeating myself. Next slide, some meta stuff. Um, this will be rather short. Um, what hurt us most during working with reactive microservices is a lack of monitoring. And we had centralized logging, we had um, metering, we had alerting. We kind of did it, but we didn't take it to a level that we would now do because we know better. So. Everybody knows unit tests. The basic idea is to come up with some edge cases and some expected cases, create tests, and make sure that input and output match. Um, that's almost impossible in a dynamic system. If you have like dozens of millions of messages going through the system every day, forget it. Um, same holds for manual checks. It's just super exhausting for the product owner, and yeah, he will consume too much beer. Um, so what actually needs to be done, of course, proper logging, proper metering, proper alerting, and investing time in that. Um, it's hard to come up with examples, but except, especially um, actually investing time, like really discussing log levels, what do they mean, making sure that logs are clean, coming up with awesome metering, like um, I can totally recommend Prometheus because it's awesome, having proper alerting, having um, rules for things that could go wrong, like um, somebody clicked this button in the back office 10 minutes ago, um, is it okay that this and that product is still on the website? Like doing cross-system cons cross consistency checks. 
That's the only thing where we are hurting microservice, um, the microservice uh, paradigm and are actually accessing databases because it's easier and faster. But for that, it's okay because it's not touching the application. So what we do is we probe different systems to make sure things are consistent because then we know if something breaks within like minutes or sometimes hours. And of course, collect patterns um, because as you can tell, I like patterns, so why not recommend that? Um, talking about patterns is usually, or in my experience, more productive than talking about the actual problems because it adds a certain level of um, abstraction. And we're almost through, by the way, no worries. Um, service communication. We had this chart before, and I would like to make a short point about like publish, subscribe versus um, versus writing into systems. No, I would like to make a point and I will make it now. It's hard to make it in one sentence. We have these two cases. We have um, A, B, and C. And here, B and C subscribe to A. And here, A is actually issuing commands. Some might know the CQRS pattern, but it could also be RPC. It can be anything. Um, here, the receiver does the lifting. So the publisher is unaware of the receivers. I doesn't know if they exist, um, how many ex of them exist, and what data they are expecting. It just does its thing and publishes. Here, the um, receivers are completely unaware that publisher or that that senders issuers issuers exist. Um, so the issuer has to be aware that they exist, has to address them and send commands to them. In our experience. Um, Commanding is a bad idea. That's not from us, that's from the internet, like you can tell from the good image quality. Um, the problem with commanding is that the issuer has to know a lot about the receiving side, and the coupling is much tighter than with publish subscribe. Um, this is, I think, slightly over the top. I would, I would sign it, but it's a bit too much. So sometimes you really need to issue commands, sometimes it's important to push, but it's a bad practice. It's like with singletons. If you're creating your own, um, I don't know, Raspberry Pi, and you just have one fridge that you want to control, then a singleton is okay. In normal cases, it's not. And it's really important, or it helps us a lot in designing systems to um, accept that data sources should not know who is using that data, and that. Um, it's, it helps to think about events as data and not about commands. It's not like I intended B to do something, so I send out that intention event. It's about I did something and then B decides how to react on that, like react, pun intended. Um, so that helps big time. Yeah, that's what I said. So, last one. Um, another pattern, um, and this is actually the only message flow pattern that I am talking about today because the others tend to get rather dull for people who haven't worked with reactive microservices, which is everybody. So 